Welcome to Dojo Podcast, the podcast where we talk about DeFi stuff and get you interested in all things DeFi. So uh, today I'm joined by my co-host, Mara. Uh, Mara, why don't you introduce yourself for people who might not actually know you? Hey, yeah, super happy to be here. Very nice to, to have new folks outside of the, the DeFi Dojo listening in. I'm the head of strategy over there. My background is that I've been around this uh, space for, gosh, what, uh, six or seven years now in, in DeFi. I've, I've worked in kind of a, a number of different capacities, worked with some major L1s, worked, worked with a ton of different uh, DeFi protocols, but kind of where my core area is, is just like focusing on like the more analytical strategy side of DeFi. I also work with uh, different family offices and liquid funds in the space, helping them kind of figure out what's going on, how they can optimize yields on chain, but also making sure that they're not taking uh, too much risk. So yeah, that's kind of what I do. And I am going to be using this crazy cartoon head for those people that are going to be watching on YouTube or Twitter. So I am uh, semi-anonymous, but yeah, really happy to be here with you, Stephen, kind of chatting about our favorite thing, which is uh, decentralized finance. This cartoon head is the most he's ever been doxxed, so you guys should feel privileged. So as a head of research, Mara is my go-to guy for so many things in this space, and I'm going to pick his brain a little bit, and we'll, you know, I'll try to also contribute. First things first, right now, we just had the Eigen launch. Price is not so good, uh, but there's also an upcoming incentives season thing. Uh, can you sort of explain that to me like I'm a five-year-old? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I mean, I don't think we should just say price not so good. I mean, I like I'm happy, you know, like I think we all expected price to dump. Like, Eigen has been this token which has had an amazing amount of like people farming it, an amazing amount of like TVL locked up into it. There's a tw it's a 12 billion dollar protocol. It's had a lot more TVL. So, of course, that there's going to be people who have been farming this thing that need to actualize the yield. There's people that were just farming it to get, you know, yield on their ETH. So what I'm expecting this fractal to look like is, you know, we, we, we started about four bucks. We pumped up. We got a little bit above four and a half dollars. Now we're heading back down. You know, it'd be interesting to see where we end up. I wouldn't be surprised if we get to three and a half bucks, if we get even two, three dollars. But I think that there's quite a bit of recovery uh that this could have i think it might have that classic like v-shaped fractal or recovery that you see from an airdrop um so i you know I, i'm cautiously optimistic i personally have not uh you know like sold my my eigen tokens i'm kind of holding on i have been LPing, and that has been wildly profitable for the last like uh whatever not even 12 hours the last like nine hours since it's been live um but you're, but you're yeah. LPing it is that that's a one percent pool still or did they open up other pools i'm still in the one percent pool I, it was really really hot for like the first six hours but i haven't adjusted this morning but i think i'm up like seven percent on what i lp'd uh, which is pretty fantastic and i was in a pretty wide range so um that's incredible yeah. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that happens with these big events is that if you throw in any liquidity, you can often throw it in the 1% fee tier, which is amazing. For those who don't know, that just means that every swap, the uh, emotional value swapped pays 1% on their swap, and those fees go directly to the liquidity providers. So it's, it can be super lucrative when it's the only liquidity available, and it just has a ton of volume for launch day events, which is uh, quite amazing. And so like, I am, I'm looking at Tia right now because, or thinking about Tia, because it also had this uh, huge airdrop, like gigantic airdrop, immediate dump. And then right after that, what we saw was a pump, like, like you know, you couldn't even imagine. And so I have this thesis about uh, airdrops, which is that it is a brilliant distribution method because what you do is you give a bunch of tokens to mercenary farmers. I think it's like a, a second seed round. So you give a bunch of tokens to mercenary farmers. What are they going to do with it when they get it? They're going to dump it because they're, they're mercenary. Now they don't have a long-term investment or alignment, most of them, right? And so they dump the price really, really low, below what it should actually be valued at, at least for these bigger projects like Celestia, like Tia, like even Etherfi, I think, for the very first season. They dump it, which gives institutional investors who have a better idea of what the actual value, fair value of the token should be, they scoop it back up, which is why we see this. What, what is it called? The smile curve? Is that what you call it? 
I called it a V-shape, uh, like recovery curve. But I, I'm I'm no technical analyst, so I don't want to LARP is knowing the names. <laughs> I, yeah, I've already called the smile curve a V-shape recovery. I like that. I would love to see a V-shape or a check mark. You know, a little bit down and then way up. I hope that's what happens uh, here. And so, my me personally, I am I'm staked. Uh, I'm you know selfishly plugging our, our, our own products. Um, I am staked with the, the DeFi Dojo. Uh, but I, I think there might be ABS opportunities with that. There might be additional yields we see. Also, I kind of think we're going to see something like what happened with Celestia or even EtherFi. EtherFi saw a huge uh, upward trend after the initial airdrop. And if that does happen, hey, maybe this, uh, this airdrop will, will do some multiples. I, I think it's really possible. I mean, this is the, one of the most hype projects of this year. I think that, you know, it, it's been loved. It's been hated um you know just because of like some of the challenges that they face but i do think that like as hype goes around new launches this probably will be the biggest maybe we'll talk a little bit later on about some other projects that are upcoming that might want to like rival the the like you know magnitude of, of eigenlayer but symbiotic being the obvious symbiotic but also other stuff launching like barachain right or monad or um mega eth you know they're not in the same vein necessarily in terms mm. of being restaking but they're trying to be like major launches this year and capture kind of that mind share that zeitgeist of what's going on um anyway what, what i'm saying about eigenlayer is like it makes sense there's all this pent up like frustration there's all this pent up liquidity it's all probably going to get sold in the next like few days i agree i i have um some stink bids like set on eigenlayer uh at like i had them at two dollars that felt like a little bit you know maybe too uh too excitable so i've moved them up to two dollars and fifty cents but like that's where i'm a buyer at those kind of levels and also you know i'm staked too i i have like about half of my eigen liquid i have about half of it staked i do think you know from what i've heard uh there definitely will be airdrops coming out you know we're seeing products like for example etherfy and renzo both just launched uh products that are like liquid staked eigen so for etherfy it's called e eigen for renzo it's called easy eigen and and what they're going to be doing is they're going to be auto compounding um and and that kind of gets into one of your questions from earlier which is like what is the new upcoming rewards look like for eigenlayer so just to remind folks when we started off we had eigenlayer you could natively restake it you didn't get any points no one really knew what was happening but you could just restake it then we went into having points which kind of launched a thousand ships of lrt protocols obviously etherfy being the biggest uh, also stuff like renzo and puffer and kelp you know kind of like uh quite big as well and a lot of those have already had their airdrops but what we found out was they retroactively eigenlayer did a snapshot that ended on march 15th of this year and so we all kind of could go and we could claim those tokens. It was before a lot of the DeFi kind of, um, you know, like composability had happened with these LRTs. And so that kind of ruffled a lot of feathers on different people. Then recently we, you know, now have claimed the second season of Eigenlayer, which was from March 15th of 2024 until August 15th of 2024. And that's what this kind of sell pressure that you're seeing, that's kind of like what a lot of people have been claiming recently. But we're also since August 15th into this new phase of things. And that's what, um, for those who are watching on, on Twitter and YouTube can see here, we're in what's called programmatic rewards. And this is 4% of the total supply of Eigen that's going to be distributed. I don't think that there's a time frame, so I don't think we know exactly when it will be distributed. Maybe it's a year, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and so th out of that, it's distributed. So there's 4%. 3% is going to people that are staking, you know, ETH essentially and different um, assets. And then one is going to 1% is people that are staking their eigen. So what does that mean? It means two things. First of all, you know, continuing to hold your ETH in eigen layer is profitable, especially people who are doing, you know, loops or getting some sort of leverage on it. I think people have calculated roughly that, you know, depending of course on the price of the eigen token, but it might be an additional somewhere between one one and a half, maybe very ambitiously 2% APR on your ETH. Um, and then two, people who are staking their Eigen tokens are going to be receiving an APR for that as well. I've heard estimates it might be somewhere between 5 and 9%, depending on exactly what percentage of people end up uh, staking their Eigen. So I'm continuing to stake Eigen. I'm earning Eigen. Wait, wait, um, was that 5 to 9%? Can you uh, say that again? Yeah, so... 
if you if you see here on this list it says one percent of the total supply is going to people who are staking their eigen yes um, and so oh know, I, I was see. talking yeah so that if you break it down um it, it depends a little bit in terms of like what the steady state is of what percentage of the eigen supply gets staked but the the estimates i've been hearing from people kind of in the know is that it will likely end up being something between five and nine percent staking apr like that's what this is the, where you're getting the, the easy eigen and the uh whatever um ether eigen is that's going to be yeah, a, a wrapped auto compounding version of that yeah exactly so so they're doing that because it's this wrapped auto compounding version for for folks you know who are not doing that or just staking their eth you will be able to now go on a weekly basis and claim it you don't have to wait whatever it is six months three months all these crazy long periods we've been waiting for these point programs we'll be able to go and get those rewards on a weekly basis, which will be fantastic. So whether you're staking Eigen or whether you just have restaked ETH, um, you will be able to go and claim your Eigen layer tokens on a weekly basis. Also, you know, I think it's going to be maybe in the next week or a couple of weeks, all of that period. So like, you know, for the folks who have still been farming Eigen layer post August 15th. So this period of like, you know, I guess it's like a month and a half. You also have eigenlayer tokens waiting for you that will be in your first claim for your programmatic rewards. Like this program already started and it will be retroactively receiving six weeks of these rewards um, sometime in the next like I, I've heard it's going to be October 5th, but like we don't know that for sure. But, you know, it'll start sometime in October. That's incredible. So you're saying there's there's six weeks of built up post uh, post August 15th rewards. So those will sh probably come out sometime around October 5th or early October, even mid October. And then after that, it'll be like a, a rolling weekly distribution that you can go and claim. Exactly. Exactly. To the tune yeah. of roughly maybe one to two percent uh, additional APR on top of the three percent staking rate. Yes, which which makes eigen plays you know still very much interesting, right? Like makes it interesting to stake your eigen. It definitely makes a lot of the you know plays that the DeFi Dojo and and of course Steven on Twitter have been talking about for you know months now very interesting. Things like loops on Compound, loops on Ave, loops on Gearbox, loops on Silo. There's a lot of kind of very interesting things that are out there that you know remain interesting because of this new programmatic reward, the season three that uh, eigen layer has launched. Right. I mean, this is one of the things that we talk about in the dojo so often is is how to actually, so like, we, you know, all the theory, which you are incredible at, we then take and then apply it with, with actual yields. So for me, what I've realized after uh, years in this space is that almost everything in the yield space is interest rate arbitrage. You know, you're looking at the interest rate or yield of some collateral asset or some asset in the space and trying to get a find an inefficiency between that rate and some other rate. The most common type of, of doing this is uh, what we call liquid staked looping, right? Where you take a high yielding piece of collateral, throw it in a money market like Ave, for example, something that has a lower interest rate than the yield in your collateral, and then just loop that into infinity. And so what you're saying is with this additional 1%, maybe 2%, uh, on this collateral, we're now looking at a 5% collateral, and maybe even more than that, if you're looking at Renzo or, or EtherFi and they're doing some sort of additional incentive campaign, we'll talk about that in a second here, even if that's 7% and your borrow rate is 3%, what that means mathematically is that there's a 4% uh, bonus per leverage. So if you're, if you're 3x leverage, it's 4 times 3, so that's 12. Actually, it's 3, it's three times 3, you minus 1 from the leverage, so it's 9% plus uh, whatever the principal yield was. So nine plus, let's just say seven, you're at 16% APR. And if you're 10x leverage, you can see how those numbers get really high. Anyways, I know that's more of a DeFi Dojo thing, but the, the theory here is actually really interesting. Someone yesterday was complaining, saying that 4%, what is this, a yield for ants? Uh, and I was saying, well, you know, it, it might look like that. But when you consider how high you can leverage these things, especially with uh, exchange rate oracles where you have no risk of liquidation because you're, you're not affected by a peg, then it can get really interesting. I would just say, you know, I, and this is a fun dynamic between me and Steven is I'm always the cautious one. I, I would just want to caveat and say there it's not that there is no risk of liquidation, oh, yeah, but there is much true. less yeah, less risk yeah, you of have, liquidation. It, there know? are two major risks from exchange rate oracles that... that uh, one of them is much more common. One of them I have never seen, but it's not impossible. So the, the one uh, that is much more common is interest rates. So when interest rates 
on your borrow spike, uh, let's just say they spike to 10%. So now the borrow cost is 10%. Uh, and your 10x, let's just say your 11x leverage, that means you're paying effectively 100% APR on your principal. Or your debt is increasing at 100% uh, interest relative to your principal. So your your debt can increase so fast that it puts you in liquidation threshold and you can get liquidated. So you can get liquidated just from an interest rate. And that's the major risk for exchange rate oracles. The other one is that the underlying backing, the NAV of the asset, somehow gets impacted, which hasn't happened in, in, as far as I've seen, but it could happen. So yes, you're right. It's, there's not no liquidation risk. It's just that it's a totally different profile and typically uh, a much lower profile. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is amazing how much access to leverage we now have and how relatively speaking cheap it is. Um, you know, like we see stuff with like Ave with, you know, Emo going up to 90%, 95% LTVs. We see on Fluid, you know, even higher, like going into like 96, 97 in some cases, even Compound, who for a very long time had been super conservative with their LTVs, now getting dragged up into like the 88 range, maybe even higher than that. So it always amazes me uh, how much leverage we can get on these assets these days. I do always wonder though, like, you know, who is providing this ETH liquidity, right? Like who who is like, you know, the folks that are playing the other side of the trade. And I understand on mainnet, there's people that just want vanilla ETH, who just want to get leverage and are depositing it. But for example, on something like scroll, like like you're showing right now, who's the person that's providing $200 million of ETH liquidity there? It's not like there's a lot that you can do with it on the other side, right? And, and I wonder if there's behind the scenes kind of liquidity deals maybe going on. Yeah, I was going to say, I know two answers to this. So I've asked the exact same question, I think, to, uh, um, it was Patrick and uh, Jesse. So Patrick from Venmo DeFi and Jesse Eckel. And their their answer just made sense. One of them was obvious. And as soon as you hear, you're like, oh, yeah, of course, which is people are borrowing against their ETH. So they're depositing it as collateral to borrow USDC so that they're effectively uh, neutral on the stable coins and long on the ETH. And then they, because they have the thesis that either one, they need to go, you know, off ramp some of the value of their ETH, their long term ETH. They want to go like buy a car or something, but they don't want to sell their ETH. So they deposit it, they take their, you know, USDC and they go use it. Or they deposit their ETH as collateral, take the USDC, and then they're going and like trying to get a better yield because they're, you know, maybe they're bullish on uh, Athena, or maybe they are, want to do some like PTs on Pemble, the stable coins, whatever it might be. They, they think they can get a better yield on the stable coins than ETH itself. So that's, that's one like set of people. I, I think that's a pretty large demographic. I don't know the exact numbers there, what percent they constitute of the total ETH lent. And then the second one is exactly what you're thinking. You're saying, which is dedicated LPs. I know like RE7 and MEV Capital have worked with other people to like seed initial liquidity or seed initial deposits for borrowers because either they're investors in the project or like they benefit from the TVL increase in some way. Uh, and I do think probably a large portion of that is those guys. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. It does provide fantastic opportunities for farmers like ourselves out there to be able to go to scroll and leverage up, you know, either RAV staked ETH or um, Etherify ETH and be able to earn those eigen programmatic rewards to be able to earn different points like from Etherify, but then also hopefully to earn a scroll airdrop, which is something that in the DeFi Dojo, you know, I've been talking about um, for at least six or eight months and I'm hearing more and more that we're getting close. You know, I, I wouldn't want to like say for sure when I think it'll happen, but I do think, you know, we are, we're in the final stretch of when uh, we will see probably a scroll snapshot and then also TG happening as well. Which I mean, uh, so a lot of people in this space are saying, hey, this is Q4. Q4 is kind of uh, make it or break it time for a lot of these airdrops, a lot of these token launches. A lot of people have been waiting very much for, you know, quote unquote, October or the post election certainty. So right now we have a lot of uncertainty because we don't know who's going to be elected. Not that it necessarily has that much of an impact on the market, because typically post election, we see uh, favorable price action no matter who gets elected, just because uncertainty has been removed from the equation. I think a lot of projects are banking on that. Uh, do you feel like, I mean, Talk to me about Bear Chain. I know they're another one of these projects that is looking to launch very soon, like Q4. A lot of big projects are launching. Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the head. I think that we're hopefully going to be in this kind of bullish period. I think a lot of projects have been very reticent 
to launch over the last, you know, like quarter, say, of the summer where there's been kind of depressing price action, sentiment has been really poor. But there is this queue of projects who are waiting there, ready to go, you know, but like didn't want to kind of like launch into, you know, unfavorable market conditions. I think Scroll is one of them. I think Barachain is one of them. Um, I think that there's like a kind of a, a queue of even smaller projects who are like, you know, looking at this as well. I'm personally very excited about um, Barachain. Uh, you know, we have a, had a quite a close relationship with Barachain for a while. The DeFi Dojo validator will be a Genesis validator on uh, Barachain. And so we've been kind of quite active, um, you know, talking to the Barachain team, talking to ecosystem projects. Um, and so I'm getting very excited about it. You know, they are trying to be a bit different. Obviously, they have like the best memes in the space. I think that's like one of the things that they're kind of known for. They've got good vibes, good memes. Um, but they are actually trying to, you know, innovate and, and they have a lot of money and runway to do so. I think that they raised, what was, I don't remember the specific number, but like $200 million or something like that. And so, you know, and really what, what was the valuation? The valuation was multi-billion. Yes. Yeah. I think it was a billion and a half, uh, was, was the last raise. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like they have a lot of, uh, headwinds going towards them. They've really kind of like, you know, taken on tailwinds, 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 tailwinds uh, going for them. I, you know, they've taken on some challenging problems, though, right? Like, you know, they're going to be another kind of generalized um, layer one application. And it, it is a space which in some ways feels quite saturated. Like, you know, last cycle, we certainly had a lot of excitement around the nth L1 that was launching, whether it was Phantom or Harmony or AVAX or there's a lot of kind of like soldiers from last cycle which you don't hear talked about too much anymore and and i'm worried that you know hopefully bear chain doesn't fit into that but one of the big innovations that they're trying to do is they are trying to have proof of liquidity i was gonna um, say tell me about proof of liquidity yeah so so basically what proof of liquidity is is they're trying to um get a little bit away from kind of like the the normal proof of stake chain where people go and stake their assets and then they just get like a normal staking reward. We were just talking about liquid staking tokens and liquid restaking tokens. That's kind of like the run of the mill thing. The way this works is you go and you stake your tokens and then similar as you might on like a gauge, something like curve or something like balancer or something like aerodrome where you then you stake and then you direct emissions. That's how bear chain works. So you go and you stake your um, bear tokens or your BGT you then have a certain amount of voting power through your own voting and through your validator to go out and vote for a certain project. Then that project gets emissions in the BGT token um, and you hopefully receive a bribe back. Now those bribes will be paid in like the new tokens that are getting launched in the bear chain ecosystem, as well as like fees and different revenues that the protocols are generating themselves. So, they're trying to kind of turn the normal like staking system um, on its head, essentially. Okay, uh, can you walk me through this? Like, like I'm a uh, uh, <laughs> uh, let's just do five year old again. So, proof of liquidity is a type of staking, but somehow increases the overall liquidity of the primary governance token BGT. How? To just think about it, like the way you know Curve works, or the way you know, aerodrome or balancer works, people that have, uh, you know, staked the token, then basically get to direct emissions uh, with the amount of stake that they have, right? And they are directing emissions towards liquidity pools. So that could be, you know, an ETH USDC pool, or it could be a lending pool, or it could be any pool on any decks that has been whitelisted. And so- Okay, so it's of... not like you're staking your liquidity. You're staking your BGT token as like a, a VE mechanism where then you can vote on where emissions are then going to go. Exactly, exactly. And then hopefully you're receiving a bribe back. So like if I go and I'm voting on the ambient, you know, decks liquidity pool for, you know, whatever pair, hopefully then they're then bribing me in the ambient token, or maybe I'm getting part of the fees from the ambient like pool, right? Whatever, like however each of these protocols set up their system, I will then be compensated, not by having like inflationary rewards paid to me, but instead having bribes or different revenue directed towards me essentially as a staker. 
So let's actually talk about this is this is incredible. Uh, now we know there's going to be a token, right? Obvious enough, they're going to use it for the yep. whole proof of liquidity mechanism. They also raised a bunch of money, and they've been incentivizing people with this like theoretical airdrop. So you mentioned uh, Ambient uh, as one of the protocols that that has been bear chain aligned for a while. What are some of the other protocols that you think might be bear chain aligned or that might benefit from this uh, this airdrop? Yeah, I, you know, there are a few ways I think that you can, you know, hopefully be farming bear chain right now. No, I just want to say that like no one knows. The, the true, the real answer is no one knows besides using the test net how you can go and farm these things. But having talked to a lot of teams, my speculative way that I am, you know farming the, this airdrop and, and I am a long-term airdrop farmer. This is like one of the like very distinct strategies, which I take in DeFi is I'm kind of taking three approaches. The first one is I've been a liquidity provider on ambient. So ambient is like this new kind of novel decks. They're going to be one of the, um, dexes on bear chain, but right now they're on scroll and they're on blast. So I am providing liquidity on scroll, um, using ambient with the idea that we will likely see when Barachain does their airdrop, a kind of like partner distribution. So similar to how we saw layer zero distribute certain amounts of tokens to uh, protocols, to people that had used protocols that were like friendly towards them. I think that will then be on their, their chain, right? That Barachain will do the same. So one of them is ambient. Um, the, the, the APRs have been pretty decent you know you can do something like a eth usdc you can do btc eth you can do liquid staking um tokens or, or like wrap staked eth eth or you can do help eth eth that's been another popular one on here um you know i don't think you're necessarily doing it for the apr like that's probably you know just more icing on the cake i think the real reason you're doing this is to get the ambient airdrop and to get the bear chain airdrop hopefully um but the next one that I'm doing is what's called your LRT. So your LRT is a mellow LRT. It's a it's a LRT that's being deposited onto um, Symbiotic, and so uh, that LRT has a close connection with Union, which is this new zk proof bridge that's coming out. Um, they also are working with like some RWA project, and like there's a bunch of like the idea behind this LRT is it's a bunch of different projects coming together and deciding on one unified asset, asset to secure their AVSs. Um, and so a couple of these AVSs are bear chain aligned, specifically Union, which I think is going to be the canonical bridge for IBC assets into bear chain. And so depositing into your LRT, which is this um, mellow LRT, I think is another kind of very good chance of of getting you the bear chain airdrop and then finally the last one is dolomite now dolomite is quite an interesting borrow and lending platform they have a lot of interesting stuff going on on arbitrum and other places and i have heard rumors that they will also be a contender um on the bear chain side of things look at this um, bear chain uh, barrio testnet there we go yeah so you can see like things are actually popping up so um you know Dolomite is another one that I, a protocol I think you can use to hopefully get exposure uh, to the bear chain airdrop, which I agree with you could easily be happening, you know, sometime in the next quarter, say. And for, as far as I understand, I, I don't know if this is correct, but I believe Dolomite also has this sort of like gem mining uh, thing going on for their own tokens airdrop. So at the same time, you might be participating in the bear chain uh, airdrop. You're also participating, I think, in what Dolomite has going on for their TG. Yeah, well, so like all of those, all, all three of those things I mentioned. So if you're doing ambient, you're also hopefully going to be, if you're on scroll, earning the scroll airdrop, you'll also hopefully be earning the ambient airdrop with your LRT. They have uni points. So there's going to be an airdrop associated with that. You're going to be earning the union points, which will be for the union airdrop. You'll be earning also, hopefully that will like count for the bear chain airdrop as well. So all of, all of these, including Dolomite, all three of them, you know, they're a bit speculative, but hopefully you will be earning like multiple airdrops just by taking one single action, essentially. Are you saying that uni points were different than unions points or were the, are those two things the same? I think that they are, there, there's uni points, which is like the, um, 
the points for the actual LRT. And I think that that then gives you the other points. There's, I think, going to be Drosera points. There's going to be Union points. I think that there's an RWA project that you're going to start getting points from that as well. So the idea is like the uni points is the main benchmarking for the other points that you're receiving under the hood, essentially. What is the crossover between Drosera and Union? I don't think there's any crossover, except okay. they're all just kind of partnering together on one LRT, and then that LRT will be used as collateral for those ABSs. And I use collateral in kind of a, you know, generous way. I mean, collateral in like, th that's going to be what is the restaked asset supporting Union and Drosera and other projects that are going to be secured using the your LRT, essentially. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so you mentioned Union, and I am only very loosely familiar with Union. I know them as a bridge, and yet they're having their own LRT on Mellow. Can you explain to me why uh, this would be the case? Or what Union is yeah. and why they would have their own LRT? So Union is a Cosmos Layer 1 blockchain. It's currently in testnet. Um, but what they are trying to do is they are using ZK proofs uh, for their bridging. So I think they're going to be like the first ZK bridge and they're going to be using kind of like ZK combined with IBC and bringing that technology so that like people can move their assets between different layer one blockchains, between layer two blockchains all over the place and having that kind of double layer of security of IBC, which I think is honestly the kind of like the best bridging standard that we have right now with the added security of ZK proofs. Now, you know, when you have an AVS, uh, basically all that means is just like someone who wants to rent additional economic security. And you can think of like Union when they launch, who knows what valuation that they'll launch at, but you know, their token maybe has a market cap. I'm just going to say a billion dollars. It has a billion dollars in market, you know, in, in FDV, um, but they're securing $5 billion of ETH and stable coins and all these different assets that are moved around. Now there's a deficit there, right? Like if they're having a proof of stake chain, the total like, you know, FDV of their token is only a billion dollars. You could theoretically have a situation where someone could take over the chain and do something malicious by gaining a bunch of voting power. Some sort of I governance think, exploit. Right. I think in reality, like that probably is very, very hard to implement and doesn't happen, but theoretically it's possible. Or there could be these other kind of edge cases where you have a chain that is smaller than the assets it's securing. Well, what you have then is you have Symbiotic or Eigenlayer or Babylon or any of these restaking protocols that then enable a project like Union to go out there and rent additional economic security, you know, based off of how much, uh, you know, like has gone through the bridge. And, it, and like, you know, the nice thing for Union is it can go up and down. So like, say they have a big inflow of assets coming into Barachain, you know, uh, and it's like several billion dollars. Well, they can go out and rent more economic security for that. And then let's but say- Do that, you like, know how renting economic security works? So like my my little brain is just thinking, okay, uh, if if my governance token has a market cap of a, a billion dollars <clears throat> and someone just buys all of that, then they have control over governance and can be a bad actor. Now I've rented more economic security. Let's say I've rented $2 billion of economic security. How does that affect the, the governance vector? It just means that like, so someone else is taking risk, right? So when you are going to be, re like when you're currently restaking now, there's no like restaking risk because slashing does not exist. You're basically just like, you know, giving people your asset and they're just giving you points and tokens back. In the future, you, all of these operators and LRTs and stuff like that, it's going to get way more complicated because all of these AVSs are going to have different parameters under which they can slash. And slashing just means they're taking your assets, whether that be they're taking 5%, 10%, all of it. We don't know how those kind of specifics are going to work. And then you have, they're paying you like to basically underwrite that risk. So you think, okay, I don't think this is a very likely thing to happen. I don't think slashing really you know, under this like set of parameters will happen that frequently. So I'm willing to take 1% or some other ABS might set different parameters. And you're like, oh man, like I, that's really scary. I think it's a high likelihood of getting slashed. I don't want to participate at all. Or if I am going to participate, I want to be paid 10%, right? And so they will be paying you most likely in their own token, but it could be in, you know, other assets they're receiving as well. If it's a bridge, they're probably taking bridge fees. They could pay you in the bridge fees, for example. So 
that's how it works. Um, you know, that they're basically renting this economic security. They're renting, you know, maybe more TVL, maybe more economic security than they had within their own protocol, which means that they can be, you know, more trusted as an Oracle, as a bridge, as a different service provider in the Web3 space. Okay, now now I think I'm understanding it. So there are a bunch of AVSs. The AVSs offer services, typically to blockchains, uh, but also just to, to DeFi in general. And each of those AVSs needs economic security, and they're the ones who are renting the economic security, presumably from operators, I think. And so they're literally just like outsourcing that, uh, outsourcing the economic security to restakers. Outsourcing the re economic security to restakers. The restakers are providing the like the asset. So whether that's ETH or BTC or stable coins, the um, operators are kind of like going and then actually validating on the protocol. So they're validating on Union, they're validating on EigenDA, whatever it is. Um, and then the AVS is the one that is receiving the validation within part of that as well. They're renting economic security, which can then be slashed, which means that, you know, they're going to create a set of parameters and like basically an ecosystem within which people are either a feeling comfortable to restake towards them or not comfortable to restake towards them. Okay, got it. Awesome. And presumably renting is much cheaper than building it up yourself, which is one of the major values yes. of all of this modularity. Absolutely. Though we are seeing kind of like weird situations where, you know, FSX is now an asset you can restake on Symbiotic, you know, Ena, Res, Etherfi, all these assets, um, you know, from this cycle may end up being, you know, different assets that people are willing to go and restake. So it's kind of like, in some ways, it's reinventing the wheel. And in some ways, to me, at least, it feels like just the same old game getting played, where you have like, you know, a lot of these different assets. Uh, just being staked in a different way. It's not being staked natively with the protocol itself, right. but it's being restaked into another protocol, essentially. So it's, it's still That's effectively cool. providing the same economic security that it would have had it just been natively staked. It's just now it happens to be restaked. Yeah, which is, which is my, like my theory, you know, Ena just had their new tokenomics thing and they're having like staked Ena. And my theory is people were like, why do we need this? Why do we need a liquid version of staked Ena? My theory is that it can then be go, you know, can then be restaked in symbiotic, restaked in eigenlayer, used for economic security, for all the stuff that they're building, but also for partner protocols. Like Athena can go and lean on other protocols and say, hey, if you want to be a partner of us, you have to use staked Ena as part of your AVS plan, right? So there's all this kind of like complicated politics that can also happen behind the scenes as well. Yeah, and that would be, I mean, one day interesting to, to dive into. We've dealt with a few of those behind the scene politics before. And I think, okay, so quick aside, uh, just on the theoretical standpoint, one, there's two things that I think are phenomenally interesting about DeFi. One of them is reimagining finance. I know mean, that's kind of a gimmick or a meme, but just the speed at which protocols can try something new in the financial realm is incredibly fascinating, whether it be restaking or providing um, you know, governance or security, or if it's just like composability, taking a derivative and then borrowing against it, whatever it is, like you can do interesting things in finance at a really, really rapid and fast speed that you couldn't do before. It's like, it's experimental finance and it's finding new ways to play with, uh, I guess, money. The other thing that I think isn't, that doesn't get as much, uh, love or as much mind share is it's also reimagining governance. So the way in which entities govern themselves or entities govern each other or governments, I guess, kind of work with each other is completely being rethought through a financial lens in DeFi. And I, maybe it also happens in TradFi, but uh, I don't think it happens in as many different types of ways as it does in DeFi. And you actually, you're pretty active in governance and following forums and things like that. Have you noticed anything interesting that uh, might be paralleled to TradFi governance? Yeah, I, I think this speed running of how things work is absolutely one of the most fascinating things about, you know, DeFi. I think it's also like I've, you know, seen some of this stuff play out for good and for bad. Cosmos is a, such an interesting example of it. Cosmos is one of the most active areas for governance. It's oftentimes one of the most decentralized places. They've got the biggest nerds talking about the most idiosyncratic things. And... 
It is both a good and a bad thing. It is good because there is oftentimes a lot of innovation and new and exciting stuff that comes out of that ecosystem. It is bad because it's oftentimes incredibly dysfunctional, right? And 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 it is this kind of interesting thing of like, you know, we talk about wanting um wanting decentralization, wanting people to have like kind of a lot of like decision making power, but oftentimes you see in those kind of situations like Cosmos you know, the Cosmos hub, for example, still just being a pit, like just like this mess of like infighting and people not really kind of being able to work together and having that much like coordination, um, the challenges that can be on the other side of that as well. So I, I wonder if it's like, if these things are all like mini governments, or if they're all more like mini corporations, it, it's like an interesting thought experiment to, to like think about, you know, Maybe it's like the the governments are the blockchains and the protocols are the are the companies or you know not what analogy kind of really makes sense there. I know there was this new protocol coming out. I can't remember the name of it. Filament maybe that's gonna do this thing where they effectively they initially they're gonna pick delegates. It's gonna be like a representative democracy, and then instead of voting on proposals directly, people are gonna vote on the representative who will then have like as much vote as people voted on them and then they will represent the best interests of the voters because most voters are not spending all day long looking at governance, looking at like on-chain activity, looking at smart contracts, but they they trust specific good actors. So the, they vote for the good actor to then vote for them. So we're already seeing representative democracies form in this governance space. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. I, I think filament could be cool. I mean, I, I, I've heard they're also going to be trying to work on airdrops and kind of like having more um decision making power go to the community in terms of like how airdrop distributions and incentive programs will work i think it's a really kind of noble idea my question though is like do the projects really want that it feels like the projects like points which is this like black box like we, we recently saw etherfy and, and this like blows my mind etherfy is great they've done a lot of amazing interesting stuff but the fact that for people that withdrew from EtherFi, um, the, you know, forfeiting all of their eigenlayer tokens has blown my mind. Like it, it shocks me that there has not been more pushback from that. So basically what happened was if you participated in season one and season two and, you know, you didn't and then you withdrew all of your assets from EtherFi, like you basically like moved to Renzo or put your ETH into something else you forfeited all of your eigenlayer tokens, um, which is crazy. You know, it, it feels like they should be able to have control over the EtherFi portion of it, but like taking away people's eigenlayer points, which is kind of like, you know, the main purpose of your protocol just seems so counterintuitive. So I, I think that protocols like having this control. They like having points where they can kind of like, you know, uh, do whatever they like with it, whatever rules that are constantly changing. And I think it's it's probably too favorable for protocols right now. So we need people to really kind of push back to find that kind of equilibrium um, of, you know, it not just being these point systems that are like hyper favorable for protocols and like farming the farmers, so to speak. Right, which is the, the whole point of this, I guess, like mechanism uh, where farmers have to be incentivized enough to deposit TVL and protocols need to be incentivized enough to distribute their governance token. They don't want to run their token into the ground, but they also need to have those vanity metrics, which is TVL, uh, TVL, volume, whatever else it is. Maybe it's like restaked or market cap. So they need those vanity metrics. They get those from farmers. Farmers need yield or else they're not going to do anything. These two entities working together and how that ends up playing out long term is going to, I think, continue to evolve. Uh, right now, points is is the meta. Last bull cycle, it was um, emissions, you know, farm tokens. Typically throughout the bear market, it tended to be quote unquote real yield. Uh, and I, I do wonder what's what's coming up next. Can you quickly talk to me about like EtherFi season four? Because I guess this is this is another one of these metas, right? It's like it's a transition from points uh and then gigantic chunky airdrops to something a little bit different right well you know it's been very interesting etherfi season one massively profitable for people that that took advantage of it i you know i think that's kind of one of the biggest wins that folks in the DeFi dojo have had this year is being early to eigenlayer early to etherfi early to 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 renzo you know people have really been able to kind of like profit off of the different kind of complex strategies that the DeFi Dojo has been doing. Same thing for season two, 
you know, for EtherFi and for, for Res, there's been a lot of people who have kind of really been able to enjoy a lot of upside in these things. Even season three that just ended a couple of weeks ago, incredibly profitable people that were doing these kind of more complex looping strategies and other kind of like the bread and butter of what we're doing in the DeFi dojo all day. Now we're on to season four and, you know, I'm a little underwhelmed. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think that like this forever season, it, you know, like <laughs> is that compelling. Basically what they're doing is they're giving out 2 million, um, 2 million of the EtherFi tokens, which is a very small amount compared to what's been given out on uh, other seasons. And they're doing that on a rolling basis. So for the next four months, they're giving out 2 million EtherFi tokens. They're also giving out these LRT squared uh, tokens as well, which is, we don't really know like what that is. It's going to be this new like governance system for LRTs that are like, receiving rewards from AVSs. Um, so, you know, like those things are not amazingly compelling, not that many EtherFi tokens, pretty long period of four months, LRT squared um, points. The, the part that's a little bit more intriguing is they say that there are going to be additional rewards and tokens from their partners. And EtherFi does have an incredibly impressive list of partner protocols. So I think the Hopium that's out there right now about EtherFi season four is there might be some surprise. There might be some partner or ABS airdrop that could be quite substantial, but just on superficially, you know, like looking at season four and what you will be earning in terms of EtherFi tokens um, doesn't really inspire me a ton. I, I am still aggressively farming EtherFi and that's just because they were able to integrate into Aave and like the risk profile of looping up you know, EtherFi, ETH on scroll or in other places is still just so favorable with the eigenlayer programmatic rewards. But if someone else, a Renzo, a Puffer, a Kelp can get onto Aave, I think that they could easily be more compelling uh, than EtherFi is if they have kind of like the same uh, liquidity and protocol integration parameters, essentially. I think that's true with the exception that EtherFi has, for whatever reason, done an incredible job of pushing on the mo like the biggest money market protocols that have the most underlying collateral, which is to me compound and Ave being the two obvious. So I know it's a really, it's a, cause it's a Herculean lift. One of the words we like to use a lot to get onto Ave and they're on Ave and they have that beautiful 2.8, 3% bar rate on ETH. How do you think other LRTs can compete in this space against something like that? Well, you know, um, we did see the new Lido instance of Aave coming out. And so there hasn't been a lot of action on that front. I know things have been kind of stalled, but I do think that like Lido should not be counted out. Like I do think that there is a strong possibility that like that Lido instance of Aave could be very large. There may be a lot of wrap staked ETH or ETH that'll be directed there that people can then go and borrow. And I think that there's a good chance that other LRTs, whether it be Easy ETH, or kelp ETH or puffer ETH or symbiotic LRTs. So things like your LRT, um, things like Amphor LRT, what all, all those like mellow ones are called. I think there's a good chance that they will be there as well. So far, we haven't seen much, right? So far, we haven't seen a lot of kind of action on that side. Uh, but I do think that there's a chance where that can be a place where other LRTs can really come and play. I also think that like this is a huge opportunity for Compound, right? Like Compound, it, I find what, Ave has done with EtherFi ETH to be really anti-competitive. Like I, I think it's kind of like super strange that they've just king made one asset and that has given them so much edge. Like I think if EtherFi had not had an Ave, they would be down in the trenches fighting with everyone else. But because they got Ave, they're kind of like been lifted to this advanced status. Oh, sure. Just like, and they might get a little bit know, too comfortable. They're a little bit too comfortable. So, you know, I think this is an opportunity for for Renzo and Compound to like you know, really form a close partnership or a Lido and whatever mellow assets they want to have. I think that like, you know, hopefully there will breed more competition that comes out of it because I think when there is competition among protocols and asset issuers, farmers like ourselves really kind of can get, you know, that, that's like the sweet spot for us. We can arbitrage yep. the different rates as you were saying. But when there is this like anti-competitive stuff going on, it makes people get complacent and not value participants in DeFi as much, which I always find kind of frustrating. Yes. When when the giants fight, we tend to benefit the most because they're they're trying to 
fight for uh, us effectively. They want to win our hearts and our, well, they want to win our money and uh, we can win their yield. So um, we want them to be highly competitive. Speaking of highly competitive and also Renzo, Renzo is doing this weird thing. Right? They have this season. It's a little bit longer than uh, EtherFi's season. I think it goes until November. Uh, I th- can't remember the exact numbers, but it's like, I think it's 4% uh, airdrop, maybe it's 3% and then additional percent in res tokens. How those are going to be distributed, not entirely clear, but they're also moving into other ecosystems. Is that right? Yeah, so um, I think what, what Renzo is doing is very interesting. I do think, you know, the most competitive thing outside of EtherFi on Aave is Renzo on Compound. I think that, that like that is a very interesting loop that you can then go and do because... Renzo's current season is much more favorable for farmers than the EtherFi one is. You do get lower leverage. So like, you know, there are some nuance to, to all of this, but, you know, I definitely think that's interesting. Rez is also moving to other places. So Rez is going to have Easy Soul, which is going to be this restaked asset that will be done um, through Jito. So Jito is going to be like the restaking protocol on Solana. Rez is going to Renzo is going to be one of like the the liquid staking liquid restaking partners for them. It hasn't launched yet, but I think that that could be very interesting and you know, if we have a war between Symbiotic, Eigenlayer and Jito for our liquidity, I would be very happy, right? Like that that's the kind of competition that I want to see. Also throw Babylon's name in the mix. I want these people having to pay high incentives to attract our attention and to tra- attract our liquidity. Um, you know, that would be a super well kind of like favorable conditions rather than like everyone feeling kind of happy and complacent and only just paying us, you know, a few bips or percent here or there for our ETH, our BTC and our soul. My only fear is that Solana actually starts to win. <clears throat> so we have this interesting dynamic where in IBC, I would argue the most interesting tech is developed and tested and played with uh, in real time by maybe angsty, but but very brilliant developers. I mean, people who just get DeFi, who get crypto, who get smart contracts, who are building really cool stuff, who want to make the world interoperable. And then uh, Ethereum sees all that amazing tech and says, oh, cool. Well, that's working. That's not working. This is working. And they just, you know, build it on Ethereum. But now if we have these big protocols going from Ethereum who have tried and tested these incentive systems, these point structures, these airdrop systems, this restaking, this economic security, and bring that all over to Solana. I'm wondering, like, is this the, the first sign? I mean, we've already seen some signs, but are these more signs of a Solana pivot long term? You know, it might happen. We're also seeing MakerDAO just rebranded to Sky mm-hmm. and they're getting, you know, they're rebranding their stablecoin to SUSDS and they're also launching on Solana. Like this is one of the original OG DeFi protocols also moving over there. So I, I do hear what you're saying. It is like this weird, interesting dynamic with like protocols going omni-chain rather than kind of like this like ETH alignment, which has been like a, a you know big buzzword for a long time. I think it's good. I, again, I think it comes down to like good competition is good. I want Barachain competing for our liquidity. I want Mega Chain, Mega ETH competing for it. I want Monad. I want Solana. I want I want it to be kind of like a big and diverse space for us. But I also like. I don't know. Some of like the Solana's taking over stuff doesn't really resonate with me. Like every time I go and try to like do a lot of DeFi on Solana, I'm struck by a few things. One, the DeFi ecosystem is not that mature. There is not that much stuff to do there. And I'm sure it's constantly improving and constantly getting better. There is like more yield opportunities. There are more dApps that you can go and play with, but it is certainly, you know, it's like less mature than Arbitrum is. Arbitrum as an L2 of Ethereum has more mature DeFi than the entire chain of Solana. Another thing is the liquidity tends to be pretty bad and that's improving as well. Like there is like, you know, PYUSD has some pretty good liquidity, but like in general, if you look at your average liquid staking token on Solana versus your average liquid staking token on Ethereum, the liquidity is far worse. Um, And then also just like the user experience, you oftentimes get transactions that are getting dropped it's just like the the wallets and stuff seem to work well but the underlying tech at least from my experience of it doesn't seem to be quite as useful they have a ton going for them though right like they have like pump.fun there's a lot of like it's an easy user experience getting on there from coinbase getting on them from all these different exchanges so in some sense i think they have a lot going for them but i do think they're 
by no means as kind of like complete products. Uh, and ETH is like this deficient thing. I think they all kind of have certain elements that they've optimized for. Um, and at least for me as like a main focus DeFi guy, I don't find a lot compelling over at Solana these days. Maybe, maybe that's different. I mean, I know you've had a lot of focus on JLP and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. But what do you see when you go over to Solana? Do you think it's kind of like uh, maturing quickly or, or still having some challenges? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I will say that I was big in Solana during the end of the last bull cycle uh, because there was a lot of, I, I loved the UI. I, you know, I was into like Francium or Frankium, however you pronounce that. And a lot of the leveraged farming that I thought was, was compelling in trying to do pseudo delta neutral plays. And then at the same time, Soland had this incredible uh, liquid stake loop. <laughs> it was, it was actually because someone had like max barred against their Solana. So it was just, it was highly profitable to go in there and farm the interest rate arbitrage that we were just talking about. Then Solon, of course, kind of uh, suffered the inevitable result of all of that when FTX collapsed. And I hadn't really gone back since. However, JLP has become pretty interesting to me. Now, of course, JLP is a little bit down today uh, because prices are all down. But I always look at JLP versus Solana because I, I think if you want exposure to Solana, uh, you know, but you don't want exposure to as much volatility as Solana. And JLP is a really interesting alternative. I think yesterday in the dojo it was said it's like this magical token because when Solana goes up, JLP goes up. When uh, Solana goes down, JLP goes up relative to Solana. And then when the markets are crabbish, the token also goes up because it's benefiting from the trading fees on Jupe.ag. So, you know, I think JLP is a really good token for people who don't want full exposure to Solana, but want to benefit from Solana's success while having a hedge against Solana's volatility. If you, if you look at the price versus Solana, you can see that over you know, long enough time horizons, it has kind of uh, outperformed Solana quite a bit. It especially outperforms when Solana is bearish and all the time accumulating and collecting fees from traders who are losing on, on Jupiter. You know, and you can leverage it, but for a long time, leveraging was crazy expensive because uh, Pi USD, Pi USD, what? That's PayPal, right? Yeah, that's PayPal. Right. So they were doing this big incentives campaign. At least it, it felt like it because you had all these uh, tokens going into lending, which which skyrocketed all of these stablecoin borrowing rates on Solana because it's a very small ecosystem, which you know made it incredibly costly to leverage your JLP. Now that those incentives have been winding down, uh, two things have happened. One, it's cheaper to borrow stablecoins, which makes it cheaper to leverage, which is great. But two, also JLP, because it's become so big and so, uh, I guess, like flat in terms of TVL, the overall APR of JLP has gone down. So uh, you're still sort of getting the same effective leveraged up quote unquote APR, though I kind of baked that into the price. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I, I like it. I think JLP is potentially a better asset than Solana for most people who have a low risk tolerance. I think it outperforms Solana under many time horizons. Not, you know, if Solana is up only, it's going to outperform JLP, definitely. But if Solana acts like your typical volatile asset over a long enough time horizon, I think it's more risk adjusted. I like JLP. I think that's a great way of putting it, you know, and, and I think people get hung up a little bit too often in like what the proportions of the different assets that are in JLP is like, you know, they're like it's 60% Solana or what it would not, it's not 60. It's like 40% Solana. It's this percent ETH. It's this percent BTC. I think what you really need to realize when, when you're looking at JLP is you are basically, you are the counter to the traders. The traders tend to be heavily long Solana, a bit lo like long BTC and not very much ETH. And so you are the opposite of that, right? You're like kind of short Solana, but you're also like earning a ton from the different fees, the borrow costs, the traders P&Ls. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about it in that sense, I think that like J JLP can be really profitable as long as the traders are bad, right? And, and like you are the house, so you do have like the odds stacked against you a little bit. Borrowing and be, like using Jupiter is incredibly expensive. I like don't fully understand why people do that, but like the cost that people are paying to borrow this stuff is very, very high. Um, and they tend to be using massively high leverage. Uh, you know, they'll be like, you know, 20X short Solana or 20X long Solana or whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, if those people continue to lose and crypto is not on easy mode, I think JLP is an interesting asset. 
I think as Stephen said, if we see a period of sustained, you know, positive price appreciation of soul other stuff, like this is a counterparty vault, you can certainly get, you know, a bit wrecked. But in general, this for the last like six months, say this has been a fantastic asset, just to be holding or to be leveraging up as well. Yeah, definitely. It's it's interesting. I'm looking at JLP right now. AUM limit at 700 million. They're they're literally like right at that limit plus or minus some price fluctuation at 696 million. So uh, to me, that indicates that the only way to get JLP would be to buy it. So there might be a premium on JLP because of just it, market price. It's always been buying and, and selling. It's the same the way like, you know, this is just a, a version JLP. of... GLP from the other day and like, like yesteryear and that was uh you could only buy and sell as well and there is all these like you know premiums uh for whatever asset you're going to basically add to it but they have been able to play this game of being a 700 million dollar asset but also feeling like you know that like people need to get in now like they have constantly been increasing the rates over and over and over like the AUM has been increasing uh, and it's always nearly at cap and they play this game perfectly of always looking like you have to get in now if you want to get in at all. Um, so yeah, I think that they're doing a very good job at kind of making it feel one, like a bit of exclusive as an asset, but also making it highly performant. It's crazy that there's a $700 million asset that's paying a 30% APR uh, and has like a pretty positive price chart as you were showing both in dollar denomination and also in soul denomination. Well, I will uh, clarify that the, the price action <clears throat> is the same as the APR because JLP is an interest accruing token. So it's not like you're getting additional APR on top of its, its value. All of the values already, all of the APR is already baked into the chart. It's kind of like wrap steak teeth. So when, even though you see that APR, it's not like you get to hold JLP, benefit from its price action, then get 30% APR on top of it. You're, you're holding it and then it's just growing at a rate of 30% APR plus or minus trade p l and all of the, you know, rebalancing of the backing, whatever. Uh, and so when I'm looking at it, I, I tend to discount the APR and just look at its chart versus Solana or its chart versus USD and then say, is this an asset that I want to hold? Completely ignoring the APR because, you know, uh, that's already baked into the chart. That's a great point. And that is like one of the differences they have with GMX from GMX V1, where you would take your GLP and you would get the yield paid to you in ETH or AVAX or whatever it was separately. So, it you know, it, it is a, a little counterintuitive that works that way, but it does make the like leverage of it even more favorable because you're earning like intrinsically the asset is going up in value. It makes it like a little bit less likely that you are going to be liquidated. It doesn't mean you can't get liquidated. Of course you still can, but because it's a value accrual asset rather than like, you know, only exposed to the profit and loss and has much more volatility, um, you know, leveraging it up becomes a little bit less dangerous. Exactly right. Well, man, I don't want to give out all of our alpha all at once. Uh, as a reminder, this is just a taste of what you get at the DeFi Dojo. So we're talking about like big ideas in this podcast. But if you want to get to the nitty gritty, the actual yield farming, the actual opportunities, the strategies, all the stuff that uh, really dives into how to benefit from all this information. Join us in the DeFi Dojo Discord. You guys get a, a seven-day free trial. You can test it out if you like it. You know, stay. If you don't like it, don't pay. Thanks for supporting the very first episode and have a wonderful rest of your day.